Great. Well, it will start. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's going to be great listening to Thomas's talk. Um, so his research focuses on social insects and hence working here on bees at the moment. You do get any colleagues at the back there. Um, I looked into some of the background and Thomas has done his, his first degree in biosciences at the Stratton campus. Uh, 2013 finished that, then went to do a PhD at Bristol, finished that in 2017, and then had a three year postdoc at Louisiana State University, a good place to be, and then joined the University of Exeter again in 2020 with Juliet and colleagues in the research, some of which he'll talk about today. So his title, as it says up there, is Decoding the Food Organism. From collective cognition to artificial intelligence, it's going to talk for about 45 minutes. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have time for questions, discussion, and we will include everybody on the Everybody who's joining from home or at wherever you are, we'll make sure we bring you in as much as possible. Thanks, Thomas. And to you. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, as you heard from the title, I've tried to Fit as many buzzwords into it as we can, <laughs> so, you know, stay the talk has to be done. But what I'm going to try and do today is unpack some of that to really give an overview of why I'm interested in social insect research and also how social insect research can have serious applied consequences and benefits in the real world because we are in the ESI after all. So, operation, right? I think to begin, I'd like to do something which I always try and do to help us empathise with the world of the insects, uh, which is giving some examples of behaviours that in their complexity I think are fairly unique to humans and to social insects. So we have examples like agriculture, so we have leaf cutter ants in the genus Atta and Acronermix. They don't actually eat the leaves, they're using them to fertilise their fungus gardens in the nests. We have architecture, uh, this is a termite mound in northern Australia, most likely a not as it's a termite genus that's made it, but they're known as cathedral building termites. Several meters high, a lot taller than a human, and quite a feet in itself. We then have democracy, which is actually surprisingly common in the social insects in terms of decision making and voting for options, such as a swarm of honeybees that's looking for a new nest site. And then finally, not such a great one, but we have slavery. There are actually several genres of ants that are obligate slave raiders. So that's a um, polyergus queen there, the rhino. She's being tended to by an ant of a different genus, Formica, which is one that's been captured. And in fact, these ants rely so heavily on slave raiding that they can't feed themselves and they have to send worker raids out to go and collect the brood of the kind of host species to get them to do everything for them. Right, so the reason I think all of these aspects are really interesting from a social perspective is that we can say that social insect colonies are generally self organized. And what that means is, they don't operate with a central actor of control like maybe a human society with um, a monarch or a ruler or a director, but rather the information is distributed across the network. But at the same time, we have these complex behaviours, and so it kind of raises the question of how are things controlled at the group level um, if it's not by some kind of directing over architecture. So, how exactly are societies going? Well, for a start, it's not that clear here, but there's a colony of ants there at the top in test tubes. And they're not being controlled by the queen, although she is very reasonable there. Um, so what is actually happening is that individuals are reacting to local cues and local responses. And this is then percolating up to sort of these emergent collective properties of the group. Uh, and I thought a nice way to demonstrate the kind of phenomena of emergence, which is when systems develop new properties that are more than the sum of their parts, by showing very simple particle signature. These particles are attracted to each other with a force that becomes greater the closer they get. And what we can see from the simulation is that without changing any rules at the level of the particle, we actually start to develop different group patterns as we increase the number of particles in the simulation. So we're not changing anything else, we just have more and more particles, and you get these elegant and, and interesting patterns of the group. So emergent systems kind of lead to very large levels of complexity, even from very simple rules. And in fact, they're very hard to predict for this reason. And we as humans want to try and predict them better. For example, weather, not very good at predicting that. I'd like to be better at it. And other things like the stock market, which I think we're equally awful at understanding because it's an emergent adaptive system. Okay, so almost then with the introduction here, but just to give some examples of ways that social insects are already being utilized by humans 
We have some examples from termites where the cooling system of the termite mound is passive. It uses the uh, shape and the architecture of the funnels to ensure an optimum temperature. This has been replicated in human architecture. So this is a shopping center in Zimbabwe that uses exactly the same gallery structure as the termites to provide passive cooling without the need for electricity. They're also really good at subtracting experimental systems. You might have a single organism, which is analogous to a superorganism, there's a colony of insects. Because of that, unlike with a single organism, it's hard to manipulate cells and add and remove them. But a colony of insects, where the worker is effectively equivalent to a single cell, we can conduct many more manipulations. And finally, and I think this one's really interesting, some case of bio-inspired algorithms. So these are Dorilus uh, driver ants. They're completely blind, but they managed to swarm across the landscape using pheromones to make these really efficient path structures. Equally, these macro terminates have very poor eyesight, if any, and they're using pheromones to provide optimal paths through the environment. We can use these products or the algorithms behind them or ant quality optimization algorithms to work out routes for vehicles and quite importantly, to work out the most efficient routes for um, internet traffic. So today, I'm gonna to give three examples from my own research and of course that my collaborators, but I think sum up diverse areas of social insect research, but which each have the united theme of being kind of emerging from, from insect colonies. So first I'll talk briefly about collective cognition in ants, which is a nice theoretical one. Uh, then social immunity in honeybees, which has some real world serious economic and ecological impact of the wild life. And then finally, artificial intelligence, how we can use this to learn more about kind of deep goings on with the colony of insects, but also how we can use it to deal with the threat of invasive social insects. So first, collective intelligence. Well, I should probably define it. When we talk about collective intelligence, we kind of have the idea that a colony of insects is somewhat analogous to a brain. Whereas a brain makes decisions based on the behavior of individual neurons, we have a colony of bees and decisions are being made through the actions of individual workers. So this is a swarm I set up in Louisiana. Um, there's a wire coming down from it. I'm using that to listen to the bees to see what noises they're making so I can see that they have made a collective decision about moving to a nest site. And the nice thing about honeybee swarms is they're able to assess many different nest sites across the landscape for miles around all at once, which is really a case of parallel processing, but at the same time very cohesive because all of this information is brought back to the swarm and then it's able to make the best possible selection. And I always like to make a comparison that insect colony democratic processes are, are usually very quiet and they're usually all working together with a nice cohesive pipeline because everyone has the same goal, which can be contrasted to human <laughs> Which not always. <laughs> I can let you imagine what I'm saying. Um, so, but of course, the question here is that how do we regulate the processes in insect colonies? How is this done? And behavioural thresholds are incredibly important for that. What I mean by behavioural threshold is it's simply a level of stimulus that, if hit, a behaviour is conducted. So, if society or uh, hunger goes up to a certain point you then conduct a foraging behavior. And that's actually a, a nerve excitation threshold, but it's the same concept at heart. It's a yes or no, depending on the level of stimulus. And it's really important for insects because it minimizes the cognitive requirements of decision-making at the individual level. That's important because they only have very small brains. So that's a one million neuron brain of a bee, which is actually a large brain by social insect standards. In contrast, that's a human brain with 86 billion neurons. So making things simple at the individual level is important, but at the same time, they maximize group intelligence by being flexible and robust to changes. So one interesting thing about thresholds is that they have a lot of variation on heterogeneity. And this, of course, happens with most biological systems. We have things like bacteria that have different thresholds to how they respond to uh, antimicrobial toxicity in the environment. We have um, this ant, which is Campylotus rufipex. They have uh, thresholds that they respond to temperature, and that will differ between individuals. But these can be functional. So in the case of honeybees, we have a fanning threshold. So when the temperature of the colony reaches a certain point, bees begin fanning. But different groups of bees start at different temperatures. And that means that as the temperature rises, the response is graded as more and more bees begin to fan, and it stops overcompensation. So what I'm interested in, and now we actually get to, I think, some content, which is what is the effect of heterogeneity in, if there is any effect, in um, threshold responses on collective cognition. And to describe this, I'm going to talk about the model system of the ants, Temeforus alopenis, also known as rock ants, because they live in these rock crevices, and they are actually a native species to the UK. They're really nice because you can replicate them 
the colony level in the lab easily. They had these really tiny colonies that you could fit between two transparent microscope slides, and then you could scale this up. So I have to apologize for this image. I always use it, and there is a reason to it. But it really nicely demonstrates that it's literally a model system that you can hold in the palm of your hand. So we have a queen, we have workers, we have brood, all in the size of a single microscope slide. Now, these ants are always looking for new homes and trying to improve for a better quality nest because their nests in the wild are quite unstable. And because they're always looking to improve, there's this searching process that works things up. And then when they find a new nest, they'll assess it, and if they like it, they'll start to recruit more workers to that um, nest. And this process is known as tandem running, which looks like this. It's quite funny. Basically, the leader is getting the ant that's following to take this really torturous path so that she can teach her the location in the landscape of the new nest. And then once that follower reaches the nest, she'll make her own independent uh, decision of the uh, quality of that nest site. And if she also deems it to be good enough, she'll start conducting her own tandem run with another ant and so on. And this uses what appears to be a sort of probabilistic quality threshold. So they assess how good they think the nest is and they make the decision based on it. So you see positive reinforcement of better quality nests with more and more tandem runs to the point that eventually once enough ants have gone to a new nest site, the colony as a whole will emigrate. And that is done by this behavior, which is called carrying. But basically, because they're no longer making decisions and their choice has been made, they just try and carry everyone across as quickly as possible. It's all quite ridiculous. I should note with the uh, RFID tags we've got on them so we can tell which ants are which. Okay, so the cool thing about this is it appears to us really relying on the individual perceptions of ants because an ant looks at a nest, assesses it, and then goes, mm, how good is this? Is this good enough? I'll recruit to it. And these uh, perceptions or thresholds of acceptance differ between individuals. We can reliably show that uh, through quite a lot of experimental data to the point that some ants almost always accept them. Nests, some of them almost never accept them, and some are in the middle. In fact, most of them are in the middle. So really, what is the impact of that on the collective decision-making process? And that's where I kind of employ my own experimental design to really investigate this and tease it apart. So to do this, I individually identified many, many, many far more than I'd like to admit. And so we have a painted worker there, so we know who to. I then produced an experimental setup with nests of known quality. Now we know very well what ants like in a nest. They like it to be dark, a small entrance, and enough room to expand with it. So using and manipulating these traits, I produced poor quality, good quality, and excellent quality nests. Then allow them to assess these nests and see how long and what behavior they're conducting as they assess. Because reliably, the time spent assessing a nest is proportional to the probability of acceptance. So the better a nest is, the longer they spend assessing. A bit like if you were looking around a house, if it was really awful, you kind of want to get out as quick as you could. If it was really nice, you'd be asking more questions and so on. So awful analogy, but you get the point. You can then use this to map the acceptance probability thresholds uh, within colonies and across colonies. So now for the fun graph, oh, uh, which is the results. Uh, what I found initially is that individuals where it varies widely in their perceptions. This particular graph, we can see three qualities of nests, the poor, good, and excellent, and the amount of time that ants spend assessing those nests. Now with the poor nest, it's clear that the majority of individuals spend almost no time assessing it, and in fact, then most of them ended up rejecting it. For the good nest, slightly fewer ants were spending a very little amount of time, and more ants were spending a bit longer and more were accepting. Whereas for the excellent nest on the far right, we see that actually many more ants are spending a lot longer in it, and many more are accepting it. And then the other thing that was a real question we had is that are these kind of levels of quality preference, or how picky are an ant is, is that actually conserved for the same amount across experiments, or is it just totally random? And the answer was that generally speaking, ants maintained their uh, distribution in the preference threshold, so that an ant that was very picky in one situation would continue to do that. So it appears that this is uh, something of a property level trend of the ants themselves. And finally, we found prior experience modulated it. So we could give ants different nests to look at in different orders. When we go from a poor nest to a good nest, we see that the good nest is doing better, so there's more ants spending more time. But actually, if we go from an excellent nest and then show them the good nest, suddenly that good nest doesn't look quite as good and loads of more reject. <laughs> which does again make some sense because then if an ant uh, encounters two nests, that will then deflate the quality of something that's poorer and inflate the quality of a better nest. So, what does this all mean? Well, basically, better quality nests are always favored at the colony level. So, we have faster recruitment indicated by that red line there. Um, but at the same time, the question 
of what is the point of ants with low thresholds or high thresholds that aren't in that optimal medium? Well, the answer is, in some scenarios, the nest might be destroyed, or their home colony nest will be destroyed. And in those cases, you need the ants with lower thresholds, because if even only low-quality options are available, it's still better to move than to die. It's sort of any port in a storm dynamic. So it provides that sort of flexibility and robustness. Likewise, if really good nests are present, you need some very discerning individuals who can still differentiate between them and lead to that positive recruitment and reinforcement process. Finally, and I think this is the most important point that we consider as collective competition, they can do all of this without any individual ant visiting more than one nest. And so the nice thing about that is at the colony level, the colony is choosing between options, but at the individual level, no one has any idea what's going on. And most ants are one nest. So you get collective intelligence, even though it's not present at the individual level. Okay, right, on to something else, completely different. Social immunity in bees. Now, again, back to definitions. Social immunity is basically where the behavior of a society is helping to enhance resistance to disease. So, for example, um, social distancing is an attempt by humans at social immunity to try and reduce transmission. Maybe not the most successful attempt, but social insects do many other things uh, which can help to improve this kind of societal defense to disease. Now, we're going to travel to the United States. This is actually a picture from South Dakota, where beekeeping is big business. Um, the majority of colonies present are involved in large scale commercial operations, so that's that big golden line. And then over 75% of those operations conduct migratory pollination, where they move hives around the country to provide pollination services to different crops as they come into blue. Now, it's not a great system. There's very high levels of mortality for honeybees, high stress environments. So these uh, two figures are from the last two years of available data from the Bee Informed Partnership, and they show almost up to a third of the most recent piece of data. And so there's a lot of research effort looking at you know, what causes this and what solutions can account for this. And to massively oversimplify things for the sake of brevity, we know that one thing is really, really bad. The single most important factor in most cases is the mite of destructor, which is a species that has hopped from the Asian honeybee Apis serrana and European honeybee, Apis mellifera, can't really deal with it and isn't adapted to defend it. Now, to tell you what the problem with this is really is, this method is feeding, and they really consume the fat body of the bees, which is incredibly damaging, and they transmit viruses. But I'll pass you over to the person who originally discovered this, which is uh, Samuel Ransom. Take your hand and put it on your face. Now imagine your hand is a parasite, a lot like a tick. But instead of sucking out your blood, it's liquefying one of your internal organs and sucking part of that out of your body. If you were a honeybee, you wouldn't have to imagine. You'd know this nightmare all too well already. I'm talking about the parasitic mite Varroa destructor. Nasty stuff. Um, and this is a real threat, really. They'll destroy colonies of honeybees if left untreated, especially in these larger scale, dense commercial operations. So there's ongoing demand to develop stocks that are resistant or resilient to the uh, parasite. And they can come in a number of different phenotypes and forms, some of them naturally existing that are then bred into these stocks. So examples include varroa sensitive hygiene, which is that image at the top, or VSH. That's where the bees are able to detect the varroa which reproduce in the brood cells, remove the infested brood, and thus keep varroa levels low. There's something known as a mite biter phenotype in that bottom image where the bees kind of just attack the mites and bite all their legs off. Um, and then on the right hand side, we have factors such as increased warming frequency, which seems to disrupt reproduction also. However, all of these desirable characteristics um, for defense against varroa need to be balanced with the beekeeping traits. So it's no good breeding varroa resistant bees if they're then hyper aggressive or don't produce enough honey. So that's where the star of this section comes in, which is a stock of bees known as polline. So that's a queen there. Polline queen, she has a nice blue dot on her back, so we know which stock she belongs to. And polline is really a kind of mashup of the words pollinator and line, so genetic line for pollination. Now, what these bees do is they express this varroa sensitive hygiene at an incredibly high rate. There's been a 20 year selection program where effectively they're thrown in this Darwinian cauldron where only colonies that can survive um, a massive uh, like varroa pressure will survive. And so we have very high levels of resistive hygiene, and that behavior, which is a social immunity behavior in a way, looks like this. So these are bees that have uncapped infested brood, 
um, about to chuck out. There's the Varel mic, she's the mother. All of her children will, well, they're dead now because they can't survive outside of the coat. Um, so that then just stops the reproductive process from progressing. This is great because it also stops the transmission of varroa pathogens. Um, and the other part of the puzzle is that they have nice beaking traits. They're docile, so there's one on my hand. They're nice bees to work with. Um, and they're genetically distinct from many of the other stocks used for breeding. I think this is a really important point. This is a PCA analysis here, and that circle shows the genetic cluster for whole line bees and their derivative stock known as helo bees. And note, because it's quite far away from all the other stocks, it shows that while the breeding program has been very effective at producing something new, but it also means they won't lose all of their traits from a single generation of outputs. So, it's all very well and good to have this idea, but we need to test them at a large scale in real commercial operations to ensure that they actually perform. And that's where a large part of my work came in. Um, we are really almost a large scale field study with over 720 colonies based all across the US uh, to compare the performance of pole line bees to the current best uh, commercial option, which are known as commercial Italian colonies, but we're just going to call them commercial for um, to see without varroa treatment how they won't perform. So we really need for the pole line to be effective, it needs to perform better than the current best option. So the way that worked was we started up setting things up in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, where we reduced all the standardized colonies. We then shipped those up to South Dakota for honey production. It's a big honey producing region. Um, and then down to California for almond pollination after the winter, which is one of the large sources of revenues in terms of pollination. Probably if you've ever had almond milk, it's probably from uh, California almonds, at least, at least some of it is. Um, and the important part was that we gave all of the colonies a normalized treatment beginning to, to remove her up, and then we left them to their own devices. And it is normal to treat colonies with mitocytes to keep them alive, but we didn't do that. So what then happened basically for a apocalypse. So this is the uh, graph showing commercial colony variables and their survival. And for each of the uh, points, they're a sample from a colony and they're collected together um, with these uh, lines for samples from the same colonies. And what we see is that from May to June, varroa levels go crazy and the red dots show colonies that died. So basically almost everything died. So by February, we had a very small number of colonies left, which might be expected. But for the pole line bees, it's a lot better they managed to keep the majority of the control of varroa levels and many more, but rather many less of them, died with more surviving until the end of the year. Now, at the kind of larger scale level, that translated into double the survival rate for pole line bees compared to the standard commercial colonies, which is good, like a twofold increase in performance effectively. Um, while they also, for the colonies that survived, they maintained large colony sizes um, and had good honey yields. One quick final note is that viral levels, especially deforming virus A and B, were generally lower in the whole line bees, which would be expected due to reduced transmission. Okay, so that was a really kind of nice field test, but what we then are moving on to is, is making these, these bees commercially available to beekeepers and hobbyists and really anyone who wants to use them, because I think really at the heart of it, it's a really nice sustainable solution to um, this parasite, because you don't to get, like, to get the benefit of pollen bees, you're not necessarily needing to apply as much treatments for using less chemicals. And if you do, then there's nothing stopping you from having both working together. Um, so we're trying to make these available for a large scale breeding program where we effectively export the drone semen to uh, Hilo in Hawaii. Uh, they have a really nice existing breeding infrastructure and they also uh, have quite very low levels of growth, so it's a good kind of controlled environment. Um, and from there, we can then ship the wings out to make them available to beekeepers. Just for reference, Hilo is on the large island of Hawaii. And I'd like to get that. It's located exactly there, so it's pretty isolated from everywhere else. Now, just to wrap up, this is the team that's currently continuing with breeding efforts. Uh, I'd just like to point out Bob Danker at the back right there has been involved in the program for over 20 years, and Daniel Downey at the front left is currently kind of, they're both spearheading this together, um, and it's really an amazing collaboration between scientists, industry, um, and government, and it just required so much effort and so much time. So now having this like an applied outcome is really, really nice. Okay, so just a quick note on what I'm continuing to do, um, both with data from this, but with also new data, is that I'm quite interested in producing better and more generalizable um, risk modeling for bees, because one problem I think in the literature still is that we have a lot of small scale um, disease 
um, past what are tend to be parsimonious pathogen studies, but they don't scale up well and they're not really very reproducible in different areas. So I've been fortunate enough to get a lot of data inputs from Canada and the US with very large scale data sets to help to produce some more explanatory models um, and also to provide improved um, assessment of traits for uh, breeding efforts both in the US and in other countries. I've been very fortunate to be able to collaborate with um, Arthur Newbury, who's an emphasis group. He's really bringing some serious Bayesian statistical modeling muscle to it. So we're really producing these in Turing, which is in the Julia uh, programming language. Okay, right, on to the last third. Finally, artificial intelligence. And this is probably my favorite thing to talk about at the moment because it's probably the most, it's quite a state of the art part. Um, what I'm going to really go through is how artificial intelligence can help us to get deep insight into how companies work, but also how it can be used in applied form. So first of all, I thought I don't really want to describe to you how artificial intelligence can help study social mistakes. It'd be better that we got an AI to try and help us. So I fired up Jack from Chat GTP and I, I typed in how good artificial intelligence helps us study social mistakes. I'm very well, I didn't really know what's going to come out, so but it was quite a good answer. So we'll see what it says. And I'm not going to bore you with the details of everything, but basically the gist of this quite long-winded but articulate answer is that it can help us with data analysis, uh, especially machine learning analysis, which is true. It can help us with modeling and simulation of insect and colony behavior, also true. But the really salient point is the third one, and that's what I'm going to really focus on now, which is automated tracking and monitoring, especially in the case where we want to differentiate between insects in the colony that all look the same to us um, and we don't want to use paint or any other manipulation to mark them. I was quite happy with this and then I thought, you know, why don't I ask an AI art generator to draw what it thinks a social insect looks like? And it produced haunting my dreams for about <laughs> weeks. So two quick examples that I'm going to give in this section. First of all, the case of detecting invasive species and the program we've been developing known as the best AI. Is that right? And secondly, automated tracking, a program we're developing, um, which is a nice acronym, but we'll just call ARES, but I think I might be pronouncing that wrong. But anyway. And then finally, I'll very quickly wrap up with future directions for deployment of this technology and where I think um, I'm interested in taking that research. So, first of all, invasive species. Let's talk about invasive hornets. Now, this is the European hornet, which many of you may be familiar with. But there is also an invasive hornet spreading through Europe called Vespa velatina, which is this one. Um, it's commonly known simply as the Asian hornet, but that gets quite confusing because there's, I mean, there's a lot of Asian hornets, but most hornets are native to Asia. But the biggest confusion comes with the giant Japanese hornet, which is another invasive Asian hornet, but in the US. So long story short, we're not talking about that one, we're talking about the middle one. This insect has spread very rapidly since it was first introduced to France, um, despite the best efforts of our friends on the continent. And after some time, we had cleared that it would arrive in the UK. And indeed, in 2016 and onwards, we found nests um, appearing in the UK. Now, the good thing is that the government had a preemptive plan because it kind of knew they were going to arrive. And so we've been able to kind of destroy, finally destroy them every time they occurred, and no population had yet established in the UK. However, it is a kind of difficult battle because it's relying on um, public sightings of the hornet. Now, you might ask, why are we so concerned about the species? Europe has many invasive species. Why focus on the hornet? Well, the answer is because of its predation of pollinators, both native pollinators, natural pollinators, and also commercial pollinators, but specifically honeybees, because they will eat with quite good success uh, European honeybees, and the honeybees aren't adapted to deal with them. And so you end up with a bit of a nightmare scenario. So this video provided by Sandra Evans shows an Asian hornet flying and grabbing a bee. Right, oh, another one comes along to get a piece of the action. Um, in front of the hive. And she'll then kill that bee, usually by decapitation, and take the protein back to feed brood. Now the problem with this is that predation becomes so intense that the bees kind of get, I guess, scared and just stop foraging. And then they starve to death, which is quite dumb. But we've got to remember they haven't evolved with this hornet. So really what we see in Europe is that they're, they're reporting at least uh, fairly uh, quite startling levels of uh, quality loss uh, due to this <coughs> behavior. 
Now, as I mentioned, the public at the moment are our detection system for the hornets. However, fortunately, the public is not very good at correctly detecting them. So, of recent years of data, I think I've summed it up in about 31,000 plus uh, reports of avian hornets. And unfortunately, only 0.06% of those are actually avian hornets, so that's quite sad. <laughs> and so, here is where the technology comes in and where the AI steps in because you think, well, can we make a system that does a better job and that does it without the requirement of effort from the public? So, this is a nice drawing by our very own Pete Kennedy, who is sitting in the back, of an initial concept for an automated monitor that would. Um, detect or capture the image of Asian hornets as they appeared and report that um, by an automated alert system to um, whoever is interested at the time. Now, I the best payout, that's what we're going to call it. But I'm say that. So this is what it looks like in, in action. So this is the view from one of these um, monitoring stations. And this is what we were using to collect initially image data. So I think that's Pete and Juliet's very nice garden overlooking the health of it. And you can see there's a little dome thing, and that's where the camera is and is getting this image of this bait, which is attracting hornets, but also wasps. So when we collect image data from the system initially, we then label that data manually, uh, which produces these kind of masks over the thing that we're interested in. And we can then feed that into a machine learning model and say, hey, this is the thing we're interested in. This is a European hornet, of course, but we thought we'd label European hornets and Asian hornets from Portugal, the UK, and the island of Jersey um, to train the model. So we had a quite big data set of 2,000 images, um, and each of these images had varying numbers of hornets in. Sometimes European and Asian hornets occurring at the same time, um, and there were two key kind of classes of labeling, that being the Asian hornet Vespa latina and the European hornet Vespa crabra. So the system aimed to be able to detect both types and then alert when it was the Asian. So the big thing really with it was also being able to make it not detect other insects that weren't hornets, like wasps, because in fact, these would be the main things that would be appearing most of the time, and what the public often had trouble discerning were weren't hornets. So that was a key aim as well. And speaking of not hornets, we had Andy Corbett from the IDSAR, the Stratton Campus, uh, bringing the data science expertise and, and model building expertise to help us um, make this a reality. We were quite fortunate to have a small seed corn grant with the IDSAI for a six month project to develop the system. What we used as a baseline architecture for the system was the YOLO series of models, YOLO version 5, which stands for you only look once. And, oh, I've said the word from the talk, it's a state of the art object detection model. It transfers learning from pre trained object models. You build your own data on top of that, then, so you can detect exactly what you want. Um, the important part of it, and what makes it quite special, is that it applies a single neural network to the entire image. So many other models apply multiple small networks to different regions, but this just will use a single network on the whole image, which means that it's fast, it's accurate, but it's also context aware. So it can use the presence of the one thing in an image to also help determine the probability of other detections. Now, to give you a view of it in action, here is the model, just this baseline function being used on whatever exactly is happening here. And we see that it is able to deal with a lot of input data uh, and shaky bad camera angles, etc., to identify exactly what's going on, uh, whatever that is. So what we then did was we took our image set that we were using to train the model and we manipulated and augmented those images to make it more robust and to account for variation that might occur, like changes in color, um, mixing up hornets from different places, copying and pasting them, um, and changing all the angles to make it robust to different environmental situations um, that may occur during use. And finally, the good part, I can now show you the current results in terms of performance. So the model actually did quite well. Very good at predicting both types of fish. Also good at ignoring honeybees, wasps, and other things that we throw at it. It's also pretty decent dealing with many insects of the bugs, um, which I think is another important aspect of that. So, on seeing it was working really well. Andy, as a data scientist, became very nervous and suspicious. He said, well, we don't actually know what it's doing. What if it's cheating? And somehow using light levels or, or timestamp or other things in the image and using that to guess what's going on and whether there's a hornet or not. So he really came up with a really nice way of looking at what the machine is seeing, seeing through the eyes of the AI, known as layer-wise relevance propagation, which 
I really understand, but on the face of it, really, is that if you take a forward pass of a model, you can back propagate it back onto the pixels of the image to tell you what pixels are more important to the model for making a decision. So it's a heat map of what the model is using. And we see very likely, we'll read this kind of reference sigh of relief at this point, but it is picking up the hornet and it's using especially the colour markings and the outline of the hornet to determine what it is, which is great. However, at the moment is integrating this into the hardware, the field, so we use Raspberry Pis. I mean, the whole system really is running on uh, PyTorch, so it's all kind of a Python architecture based system. Um, and we've been able to really trial this with the first prototype in Julia at his garden. <laughs> and he even bought his newly born baby Molly, um, the baby's first data integration coding session. <laughs> we, we did have to use the Philadelphia tub as part of this. <laughs> the design, but uh, it was a really nice first test and got it working uh, in the field. Okay, and this is the final bit of the talk now, just to wrap up. I'm very briefly going to touch on automated tracking, which I think uh, for colonies and insects is really quite a good way to get deep insight. So one thing to note is that it's really been an explosion of technology recently in terms of object tracking and detection and identification um, from deep learning algorithms. Many of these started off in military applications, so for the tracking fire control of moving targets, um, or for maybe some of our favorite drones. Um, but these then percolated down into industry for things like fault detection and uh, measurement and production. Um, but as with most things, eventually, they turned into open source tools for science and other civilian applications, um, which includes a whole array of, again, mostly Python-based packages. So we have things like DeepLabCut, uh, T-Rex, Sleep, uh, deep post kit, and there's this whole ecosystem really built around Python of data pipelines, packages, um, and end uh, throughput analysis programs. And what that lets us do now is have this unprecedented level of insight into animal behavior and animal interactions. So from things like seeing the individual um, bones in a mouse's hand as it performs behavior, courtship, dances, and Drosophila, um, even bumblebee colonies being tracked with fish. Now, where it comes in kind of handy for me is that they allow you to really get precise um, information from insect colonies without the need to paint, to mark, or to do any kind of manipulation that would perturb the insects. So, I'll give like three quick examples of this. One is um, so these are termites, they're from our very own um, Faye Thompson, who's based uh, on this campus. She has a really nice model termite system, which I think are Zeutomopsis and Gusticolis. I think they're from the West Coast. Yeah. Anyway, what this is doing is it's tracking the termites, and you can't really see from the light, but it's building a behavioral classification MDS plot in real time. So it's seeing what it thinks are behaviors, and it's building a graph to cluster those out. So that's quite nice because it's kind of an automated, unsupervised learning of what behaviors are occurring. Then we have things like these ants, which I'm tracking with a very simple program actually in R. And what's happening here is it's allowing me to track really, really nasty insects, specifically their bull ants. So they're Australian and they're, I think they kill more people than sharks in Australia. They have a really nasty sting, so I don't want to stick my hands in there. And I can track and keep the fidelity of individuals and the queen, who's in blue there, without having to conduct any kind of marking or manipulation. Also in the lab, it allows you to conduct a lot of kind of high throughput tracking of individual behavior, group behavior. So these are some other termites, or most of the termites. Uh, Cognitive Termites from Rosanus, which has been very kindly provided by Karen Song, who's based at LSU. I've worked had termite systems quite a lot when I was there, and we now have a nice kind of video exchange <laughs> opportunity. Um, and then finally, something more recent, you can actually use AI quite robustly in the field as well to track things. So this is from a recent experiment where we were in Galicia looking at actually Asian hornets and how they may impact bumblebee colonies. But we had these I think it was 36 colonies, and um, we wanted to be able to see how the foraging activity changed over time. So instead of trying to pay a load of money for a entrance counter laser-based system that you would normally use, we managed to just buy a load of cheap cameras, about 72 of them, stick them on all the colonies, and then use uh, AI software to automatically count as individuals went in and out without having to touch them, do anything, and we could do it simultaneously without needing to be there for visual observation. Then you could produce these really nice, rich data sets from them. Okay, wrapping things up now, I'll just very briefly plug one of the things I'm developing at the moment, which is the ARES, or I think ARES, you could say, system, but it's a nice acronym because I think things have to be acronyms with AI. It stands for Anchored ROI Extraction System. So, long story short, 
there's a lot of cool AI stuff, but the missing kind of piece of the puzzle is taking tracked data and turning that into interaction networks, social networks. And so this is what this program we've been developing attempts to do. So here again are some of face termites. This is the original video. We can then apply some AI tracking to that so we know who is who. Now, ARES will then enable you to produce these regions of interest around body parts, um, which can be of course different size and shape. And so we can then start to produce classification models that say, you know, if two heads overlap and their bodies at a certain angle for a certain amount of time, then a trophallaxis event is occurring, or indeed any other social behavior that we are interested in. And we can then use that to produce some nice uh, network graphs. So at the moment, we've got a pipeline straight into Network X, so that's another Python package for social network development. And you see, this is just a very simple one showing uh, the thickness of the line is, is the amount of time that each termite spends interacting with another. I've been working with this, uh, on this with uh, Simon Nilsson. So I think he was originally uh, based at Cambridge, but now he's moved to North Carolina and he's really bringing some more uh, cognitive, uh, computational, neuroscience y whatnot to this. Okay, <laughs> last slide, I think now. What do I see being the future of this work and where am I interested in moving? Well, I think. When it comes to heterogeneity uh, in behaviors and behavioral thresholds, it's nice to work with single behaviors and single systems, but I think seeing how heterogeneity actually affects the interaction networks, colonies, and their responses to environmental challenges, because there's a lot of network plasticity, bringing all that together, and I think now we can do that with AI, and we can do it without needing to mark anything. So it's really at the, the cutting edges of what is possible. So I'd like to investigate, and I actually am investigating this, um, that's where I'm moving forward in the future. I'm also quite interested in conserved behavioral and network mechanisms between different species of social insects, so termites, ants, bees. As we saw with the house hunting, there's often a lot of overlap at a very kind of deep level in terms of how networks and self organized systems operate. And then finally, I like utilizing controlled model systems of insects, which we have quite a few of here on this campus, which is very nice. And I think really to answer some of the larger kind of network-based questions, you need controlled comparable uh, systems to do that. So that sums everything up, and that's why I'm interested in social insects and why I think they can be applied to real-world problems. Um, so thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank all of my funding bodies um, and all of the various members of the different labs who have made this work possible. So we have the USDA and LSU lab there. We've got Julia Osborne's lab here at Exeter. Uh, we've got the AMP lab in Bristol, and then we've got various non have groups like the uh, volunteer team at Jersey who helped us collect a lot of this field data. Okay, I think that brings us to the end. Uh, I'm just taking a break. Absolutely fantastic talk, um, and mention of democracy got me interested because that's something I study in <laughs> the complexities of social organization. Democracy are immense, so I had no idea that all this was going on in biosciences is fantastic. Um, questions, comments from people online and in the room? Elsa. Thomas, thanks for a great talk, I really enjoyed it. So I might have missed this, but in the first bit when you looked at the, the house hunting behavior, was it individual ants that made that, that had a go at looking for things or did they actually try searching in groups? It could have, that have affected their individual behavior. Yeah, so it's primarily individual ants because these well, this particular species has very small colony sizes, usually only 100 or, well, 100 to 300 individuals. Mm -hmm. And so they don't really use the pheromones very much. So they'll have like random searches by individuals. And then when they move over quite a large area and find something, they'll then go back to recruit. And that only really has aggregation from these once they've already found something. So most of it is completely individual. Ask another follow-up question. So, um, when you start looking at between species networks and stuff like that, so all the things you've done is this social behavior, I guess, is on species that have a very high relatedness. So how would you look at how different species might actually do this together? Or Because relatedness is really high, and that's why you have these social behaviors, I guess, and there's altruism and stuff like that. Um, yeah, well, that depends. I mean, there is quite a lot of variation within social insects. So, like, Hymenoptera, Antipes, and Wasp have a diploid yeah. obviously there. There's very high termites, less so. Are you saying, you know, maybe looking at how relatedness and then. Okay, basically, the problem is social insects are a bit of a special case 
in that they do have these high levels of relatedness. And you probably, I would be very cautious to then extrapolate from something that's a colonial based insect to something that has completely different relatedness structure. I would say probably that's not something that could immediately be done, but that's not to say it's not possible. I mean, all of these tracking systems and the one I've been working on really, we've made it so it can work on anything. You know, we could track this room and then see how we all interact. So down the line, there is possibility, but I'm going to try to stay conservative at first, but I don't want to try and make those leaps because it would probably be very Just scary. asking out of self-interest, no, because yeah. I'm looking at social behaviour in microbes, and it would be awesome mm -hmm. if we could track individual cells. We definitely can. If they could use humans in the environment to actually come up with solutions. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, I have a question about also the behavioural thresholds. Do you know how these are actually um, formed or developed? Uh, and how do you maintain heterogeneity in the colonies? Um, yeah. Well, we have no idea how they're formed. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, there are theories in that, for example, could be slightly physiological based. Like we know the other thresholds, like foraging thresholds in, in those animals, the same species, the amount of fat stores they have will affect their foraging propensity threshold. I mean, for the nest choice, yeah, we don't know what causes the underlying occurrence of it. What we do see is that you have a seven day period where experience built through, um, you know, finding nests or recruiting to nests seems to accrue. And then after seven days of no activity, it's kind of seems to reset to a sort of baseline. So that seems to be something of a maintenance mechanism. But what causes that baseline in the first place could be a, there are many different things. Sorry, connected to that, if the conditions of the nest change, like for example, if the nest is damaged, does that mean that the ants will respond adequately to that? So will the thresholds lower in response to that, or do they maintain the same? Yeah, they will respond. So, for example, if you violently destroy the nest, or, or if you destroy the nest and that occurs, and then they're put into, you fix it again, it does seem that it downgrades like the, what they'll accept. But then again, there are still some ants that can't effectively it work from that because their threshold is still too high to move to something that they might want to. But yeah, it does adapt. And also the way they make that decision is they use a quorum threshold of a number of individuals in the new nest. And that quorum threshold is proportional to the number of ants in the colony. And so that avoids a colony that's very large from emigrating just because there's a you know, low quorum threshold. And I have no idea how they know how many ants are in their own colony. But yeah, so that scales. Very clever. Hey, that was lovely. Thank you so much. And it was, well, it made me jealous that I didn't have these AI things when I was watching ants carry grains of sand in my undergraduate project. Um, going to your pole line bees, you've got this really cool sort of social immunity that's um, been under selection for like 20 years, I think you said. Um, have people looked to see whether there's a genetic correlation between that social immunity and their actual immunity or susceptibility to either varroa or the pathogens? Yes. Um, in fact, I had a graph. I had, I had to remove it because the talk was too long. <laughs> Basically, there's been quite a lot of lab-based studies looking at whether whole line bees are more or less resistant to various viruses and varroa feeding damage. And the answer is no. And that in many cases, they're more susceptible to some of the um, viral infections, for example. Okay. But that actually doesn't matter because the minute you scale it up to the colony level and you can reduce varroa levels, um, it, it seems to fix it. Which I think is quite nice because it's kind of a proof of the pudding that it's not a inbuilt resistance to the disease. Although, of course, there are exceptions. And one final thing on that, I did those viral graphs I had. I had another graph for a disease that isn't transmitted by another. And you can see for that one that the two lines are exactly the same. There's no change in effect. Cool. And with the um, plots showing the sort of colonies dying off um, with the red dots, was there sort of lower tolerance for the pole line ones, or was I just seeing patterns that weren't there? So were they dying off at lower varroa levels, or was that? I think well, it was partly um, that, yes, I see what you're saying, because you had some of those really peaking out ones in the, in the commercial. Yeah. I think the case was that many more commercial colonies got high, and some of those, the outliers, ended up getting really high. Yeah. I don't think necessarily that pole line will die under a lower tolerance level, but rather there's just less available data. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you.
Anyone online want to ask a question? Oops. Yeah, B and P, whoever that is, you're very welcome to ask a question. If you want to put your camera on, we can see you. We have time for one more question. Oh. Oh, we've got another hand up there. Karen, Karen Anderson. Go for it, Karen. Hi, um, hang on, I'll put my camera on. Hi, that was really nice talk. Thanks. Um, I was just interested in the work that you were presenting with um that you've been doing with uh, Andrew Corbett on the kind of uh tracking of individuals within uh, video sets and I just wondered are you just using red green blue image data for that or have you ever encountered a need for extending into other wavelengths to improve your ability to discriminate um, between species or individuals? Yeah well, I'd say it's the opposite in the red green blue is like the best scenario in fact a lot of what we've worked with has been based on black and white initially but there are some benefits to obviously having, having colours um, but, but so, for example, the audit tracking that uses color, but it might well work in black and white, and that has an initial step for motion detection that isn't black and white. But all of the termite tracking, so for the ARES system, you can do that without red, green, blue, you can work in black and white. Um, but yeah, so far, I think the good thing about a lot of the AI is because there's so many layers to it that it's often picking up on individual differences and pixel identity signals that we might have no idea about in our own, you know, visual range or what we're looking at. So no, I haven't had to use any additional hardware input uh, beyond that group. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, so your surveillance data you're doing with your um or, uh, cameras and AI. Are you? Is there any ability to integrate that into some sort of predictive model to predict from that data where a hornet's likely to arrive in the UK? Um, add a sort of predictive part to the surveillance. Yeah, so that's something that's been discussed quite a lot. I'd say initially that's kind of a hardware question, almost because say we could put these monitors at regular intervals for a lot of places in the UK and then see you know, if something pings or not. But the general, I think, idea would be that there'd be high risk areas. I mean, there's already sentinel apiaries that are used to try and predict. And so aiming for like port areas or blowing areas, um, I think if we had enough of them, yes. But by then it's like, it's spending a lot of money on hardware. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, again, Pete could well answer that. I bet he has an answer for it later. <laughs> but it was actually something that we discussed uh, with Andy Corbett, but it's it's basically it's another project. So uh, it's it's an idea, uh, sort of at some point in the future, but um, possibly it gets more money. Thank you. Um, ants that have the diversity of behavior or kind of susceptibility to their environment are really important so that you're covering a range of possibilities. If you apply it to social organized, self-organization people, we need a heterogeneity of ideas so that we can do democracy better. And if you look at where things have gone, it's because we've had more changes. So I wonder if anyone supplied these things from the animal world into the human world. Well, I guess we go back to Scott Martin. Yeah, so, so yeah, if you have, like, to actually make money from Scott Martin, you can adapt to the behavior distance. So there's a diversity of opinion, and it may be a right. But sometimes you get a case where not all information is available, and so everyone has an opinion that's wrong. There's no diversity, and in those cases where, where people make a lot of money because they predict something that people aren't expecting. Yeah. And so, but then these systems adapt, you know, and they become more efficient. So, uh, no, I'm yeah. going on with this. <laughs> that's the black swan thing, isn't it? It's the person who can 
can anticipate something that nobody else in the crowd. Yeah, but it's, it's also more of a property of this something going wrong at the masses level where they're like all focusing in on something and it's not right. But yeah, but basically, yes. So that is one example, I guess. Of how. I used to I think the ant one. I used to call it like how diversity promotes collective decision making or something like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it varies a lot of system because you know there's a lot of different. In some cases, it's good to have a very homogenous idea, like when you yeah. manage it. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. Quickly on that point, though, it's sort of related to your stuff. Orly and Cousins work on mm -hmm. completely unrelated fish shoaling behaviour. The decisions. If you have a very a fish with a very extreme idea wants to go that way, but the, the group wants to go this, they they have a democratized system of weighing the desire of the extreme individual versus the the naive populace, and actually weighted as I remember towards naive individuals acquiring their own information rather than trusting someone with extreme opinions. Yeah. So really interesting kind of yes. things you could apply to democracy, but with a with fish with you know. Yeah, in fact, I think T Rex, one of those programs I mentioned, that's Ian Cousin Virtual. But anyway, they made that um, for fish originally um, a lot of this. And I think mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, it's like with the wisdom of crowds when you're weighing things and you're guessing the weight, you generally see that the mean starts to kind of converge on something, even with these these crazy opinions out on the edge, that they can't weigh the mean away from what the true value is. So quite interesting. But you don't count that as de democratic decision making? Uh, you know, I don't know. I see where we go. Yes, yeah. So I, 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 I would, yeah, I think it's fair to say that, that in that case, I would say that that is somewhat democratic. I guess the difference is that it's not like necessarily a direct vote where you can say a vote was made, here's the threshold that the vote changes because it's more dynamic. But yeah, I think that is fair to say that that is a sort of similar concept. But the wild, but have you seen the wild dog study recently though? About wild dog sneezing. Yeah. So that Ooh. that really looks like democracy, right? In in I wild dogs. Explain. Yeah, I don't know. So the, it's a PNS paper, no, CSB paper last um, year, maybe. Oh, yeah, right. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, so wild dogs they sneeze. They so they make a sneeze-like noise to initiate hunting, and they see, and it seems to be. That they're more likely to initiate a hunt when more of the pack members have made that sneeze like mm -hmm. noise. So it does look like there's a voting. And they system. have like probably like a quorum threshold. Yeah. yeah. So in that case, I they think they still they weight decisions yeah. as well based on the different pack. members, yeah, so age and dominance as well. There's loads of like selective like, decision making. So, so you can have like a disproportionate effect from the Yeah, yeah. So like, it's, 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 it's aggregated for the weight that an individual has it's conditioned on like their social status and their age, I think the world of a different system. That's quite interesting because like the ants we haven't found yet. Like the weight, like one worker, not necessarily her opinion is going to be trusted any more than another worker. So that's quite nice to see how it can change, you know, like that. Social hierarchy. But yeah. It's amazing. You can do some work saying how it's more efficient in fish or ants or dogs. Time for a walk. I'm going to put the paper in the chat for you, I think. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, if there's no more. I don't know who that person is online, but we've tried to bring you in and neglected you. <laughs> um, hopefully you'll get in touch to direct. And it's been a really fantastic state of the art, a real state of the art. So much in there, brilliant. Yeah, this is so my big, that's very dry. <laughs> big thank you to you, Thomas, for doing it. Much appreciated. And it's been great to have you all with us as well. So thanks again. Yeah. We can keep you with that